But first tonight, our top story, a story that we've been tracking through this week. The bail granted to student activists and anti-citizenship amendment pro act protesters, Natasha Narwal, Devangana Kalita and Asif Iqbal Tanha will stay. The Supreme Court refused to vacate the order of the Delhi High Court, but said that the order will not be a precedent for similar cases in other courts. The court has issued notices to the three activists in a Delhi police petition which protested against a high court order that had given them bail. All of this leaves open the question of anti-terror laws in this country. Are they being misused? Do they need a review? Our top story today comes from the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has refused to cancel bail granted to three student activists, Natasha Narwal, Devangana Kalita, and Asif Iqbal Tanha. But the Apex Court underlined that the Delhi High Court judgment granting the bail would not be treated as a precedent by any court in the country to give similar relief. A two-member bench of Justices Hemant Gupta and V. Rama Subramaniam said the Supreme Court would examine the bail order, noting that this case could have pan-India ramifications because of the way UAPA, or the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, has been interpreted. The Delhi High Court's judgment, releasing three activists booked under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, has put the spotlight firmly on the contentious anti-terror law. Their release was opposed by the Delhi police, which, while approaching the Supreme Court, said the High Court, in permitting bail, had conducted a mini-trial and recorded perverse findings which are contrary to the record. As the three activists remain out on bail, their release, after 13 months in prison, has ignited the debate over what many call a draconian law, the UAPA, where an individual charged under it can remain in jail without bail or even trial, where six months' custody can be extended without even filing a charge sheet. Importantly, as the Delhi High Court noted, while giving bail to the three activists, protest and dissent cannot be outlawed by labeling them as a terror activity under UAPA. A quick look at the data compiled by the National Crime Records Bureau suggests what could be deeply erroneous about this anti-terror law. Less than 2% of the people arrested under the UAPA across the country in five years, from 2014 to 2019, were convicted. Furthermore, only 155 of the 7,840 people arrested on charges of terrorism were convicted by the trial courts in these five years. However, most stayed in jail for many years without trial. In this stipulated time frame, those arrested were maximum from the state of Uttar Pradesh. As the debate rages over UAPA, many continue to languish in jails without trial or bail, booked under the anti-terror law. Bureau Report, India Today. Now, all the focus has been on these high-profile activists or political prisoners, as they are being called, who finally got bail this week under UAPA. But the fact is, many people Innocent people also suffer because of the anti-terror law provisions. Only yesterday, two accused, Mohammed Irfan and Mohammed Ilyas, were cleared of all UPA charges nine years after they were arrested. They were released from the Taloja jail in Navi Mumbai on Tuesday night. They were accused of being part of a lashkar e toiba plot to kill politicians. Three other suspects, Mohammed Muzammil, Mohammed Sadiq and Mohammed Akram, were convicted and sent to 10 years in jail. This happened in Nanded in Maharashtra. The so, government said that I will not put me back in the back and put me in the back. And I will not put people like me in the back. I just hope that I will be a good person in this country, 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 in this country. And in the future, I will be able to sit in front of people, in this country, in this country, in this country. 
और मेरी इज्जत भी हो एक आम लोगों की तरह या कोई अच्छे लोग की तरह कि मुझे कोई आतंकवाद बोल कर ना पुकारे या कोई आतंकवाद बोल के मेरे बारे में सोचे क्योंकि तो मैं इनोसेंट पहले था और हूँ और इन शह so let's then set the stage for our face off today where we are going to be joined by two of the country's top lawyers is our anti terror laws being misused why are conviction rates in uapa so low is uapa being used by governments to crush political dissent should there be guidelines for the use of uapa my guests on the face off dr abhishek manu singhvi senior advocate and rajya sabha mp of the congress party supreme court senior lawyer and c arya masundaram also senior advocate appreciate both of you joining me on the show tonight let's come two legal eagles and i'm going to get you both to give your perspectives on the central question i want to raise has the time come to review these anti terror laws and i want to just give the statistic dr singhvi so that you can start off 7840 people arrested since 2015 only 155 convicted does that mean that there is something flawed in the way the uapa is being used the anti terror laws are being used do they need a review rajdeep let me give a slightly nuanced answer but very specific mm -hmm. i don't think the uapa can be done away with repealed abrogated because it is intended to fight terrorism point 1 yes point 2 they are misused for purposes for which they were not intended that's the real problem now it's all very well to say as we say the law will take its own course i have charged you with uapa if you are innocent you will get off that according to me is a meaningless and a largely hollow answer mm -hmm. the by the time the law takes its own course untold misery is caused judges ultimately get it right they do give you bail but by that time you have suffered a lot therefore the real question is these laws are meant to be used bona fide with correct thresholds applied by the executive let me give an example the heart of the uapa and this is important to be little technical here the heart of the uapa is the definition of unlawful activity in 20 and the other heart of it is section 15 terrorist activity both have very clear thresholds mm -hmm. succession territorial integrity of india i i provoke you to succeed or terrorist activities including possession of explosive material causing death etc now this threshold the judge may get it right after 6 months 1 year 2 years of you suffering and uh, you know uh, lying languishing in jail but the question is what authority initiate under this this threshold is clear take for example this very case and i am not talking about the bail because the supreme court has rightly not interfered with bail bail jurisprudence is established you don't interfere with bail on the first date or in the interim but why should these people let mm -hmm. us assume i don't agree with them them you don't agree with them i would not protest in that way you would not speak the same as they did by no stretch of imagination can 2 o or 15 terrorist activity or provoking or promoting succession from india be applied against them now what the police and the executive does is they initiate it and then they say you will the executive does is they initiate it and then they say you will get bail the law will take its own course so the answer to your question is while the law may be required for extreme terrorism cases mm -hmm. either you need to control sensitize and not become a rambo state on the rampage or you need to amend these sections amending these sections may have the effect of throwing the baby out with the water because genuine terrorists may get away I'll, but the point is that if you don't do it mm -hmm. you are punishing innocent people even proceeding against people so the section you use wrong. you use the word rambo state and i'll come to you in, again in a moment because in your rambo state definition there are question marks over the executive there are question marks over the police there are also question marks over the lower courts sir. it's the lower courts who refused to give these girls bail every time they applied for it so let's be clear the lower court seem to be uh, happy to play along with the with with the police and what the state wants so their role also 5 seconds, seconds rajdeep before arima yes. replies yes uh, the lower courts by and large let me tell you not this case mm -hmm. if you take the average statistics of sedition cases and these cases mm -hmm. according to me have acquitted themselves rather handsomely they have acquitted themselves by fairly robust judgments 
But the point is not that. And according to me, in this case, there was no business for the lower court not to grant bail in the first state. But the point is not that. The point is, ultimately, the courts, be it the lower court or the high court, will get it right. But as they say, as Keynes said, in the long run, we are all dead. Maybe in the medium term, we are all dead. Okay. We have suffered long enough. Therefore, that's no good, not no good to say that sir, they will get it right. I'll... Sir, the fact is, if there are unlawful, wrongful arrests, there is something wrong with the system. Arya Ma Sundaram, is there something wrong with the system? Or do you believe that at the end of the day, you need strong anti-terror laws? They are a necessity in the times in which we live, even if they will be seen by uh, civil liberty activists as trampling on individual liberties, six months custody without charge sheet, getting bail very difficult, center can declare any individual as a terrorist, NIA can seize property. All of this suggests to me excessive state power of the Rambo state, as uh, Dr. Singhvi calls it, the flip side is you need strong laws. Well, Rajdeep, I think on one point, uh, I find that Dr. Singhvi and I definitely agree, which is an anti-terrorist law is necessary. Mm -hmm. I think that Manu has also very clearly said it is necessary. Where do the questions arise, really? Such a law is necessary, and when we bring in a law for, to deal with something like terrorism, the law will tend to be more draconian than any other laws. When it's non-terrorist activities, when it's crimes as we have known them for centuries, then the law takes care of it. The laws are not draconian. The laws favor towards the finding of innocence, and they want uh, innocence being, uh, the guilt being proved beyond reasonable doubt, etc. But when you're dealing with something like terrorism, it is but natural that a draconian law comes in. Now, the more draconian the law, the stricter should be the way in which it is implemented and followed. And that is the important part. The part is that you have terrorism. You have to curb terrorism. The activities of terrorism hurt society at large, innocents are massacred. You need a law. That law will be draconian. No, but how do anti-CA no, no, but how do anti-CA protesters become, uh, get arrested under UN? How? Don't, no, don't no, that's exactly what they, happened. Why do I get it, arrested for my political views? I can tell you any number of cases where people who have been uh, accused of murder under Section 3 not to IPC have been in jail 14 years and then have been acquitted by the High Court. I can tell you any number of cases like that. Why are you not talking about that? That is unfortunately a systemic failure in India that law takes so long. According to me, a UAPA case should be finished within three years at the outside. It should not take longer than that. Well, this might be wishful thinking, this might be utopian. But I don't hear you screaming when a man who has been convicted of murder and 14 years down the line, the High Court acquits him and 14 years he's been in jail. I don't hear you screaming. No, no, one minute. I'll tell you the why I'm screaming. No, no, no. Arya Mas, no just different. a minute, sir. Just a minute. There was, uh, there was Tada brought in in the late 80s after Mrs. Gandhi's assassination and you saw in the early Oda, 90s in Gujarat. Oda, Just a minute, sir. Terrible defense. There, there, there were farmers. There were farmers who were arrested under Tada. Then you had Pota where you had innocents being picked up and there was a general sense many of them were from the minority community accused of being terrorists and later let off. Now you have UAPA being used against those whose political views you don't agree with. That's my worry. The history of this I country... I started by saying the law is necessary. Mm -hmm. Its implementation, as I said earlier, and I would remind you, Rajdi, its implementation should be done within a straight jacket. And that is why I'm glad this case has gone to Supreme Court, because I hope the Supreme Court will clear a lot of vagueness in the act. Terrorist activities, terrorism, mm -hmm. these are things which are capable of any kind of interpretation, and many judges can interpret it differently the way that says it. I'm hoping the Supreme Court will give strict guidelines as to when the act can be invoked, when it cannot. Okay. Every act which comes out has a problem of misuse. The ruling class, a governing party in power, always tries to usurp more and more power. I'm not talking about the present government. If the previous government did it, every government does it. It's a habit, a habit of the politician. That right. Any enactment they have which gives them power, they try to garner more power out of it. Okay. The point because here is, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't throw find the... out how to implement it. Find out how the judiciary can get more involved in giving reparation at an earlier period. That is what we must look at. So what not... we must look at is we know the executive will try to stretch its arm too long. Mm -hmm. That is where we need a very good, robust judiciary. A judiciary which will look into these matters 
at the very earliest and deal with it accordingly. Okay. And actually, if you tell me if things are delayed, mm -hmm. it is unfortunately a systematic failure, systemic failure, our judiciary's mistake here. And I have to say, I put the blame at judiciary's door. So you're putting the blame on the judiciary's door. You've got because Dr. Singh. it's taking too long. Okay. Such cases should be finished sir, in three years. Sir, that that's all very well, but it's not happening. I'm only showing the reality. Today, for example, Dr. Singhvi, the Supreme Court says the High Court order in the case of Natasha and Asif and Devangna will not be treated as a precedent, will not be relied by anyone before a court. Now, the Delhi High Court had clearly drawn the line that the state... Uh, has blurred the line between the right to protest and terrorist activity. Right to protest is not terrorism. That's what was said by the High Court. The Supreme Court says don't uh, keep this as a precedent. So tomorrow, if some farmers in Gujarat or nuclear activists, as was the case with uh, uh, Kudai Kulam in, in Tamil Nadu, protest, they will be arrested under anti-terror laws. And who will say anything? And we will then again uh, you know, come back with another discussion. My fear is that the criminal justice system is not equipped to deal with anti-terror laws. How do you respond to that, Dr. Singhvi? Uh, I said in my opening, I used the phrase, baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we live in an era of terrorism where some anti-terror law is required, but that is no excuse to say that because an anti-terror law necessarily must be draconian against terrorists. Therefore, we excuse, condone, or turn a blind eye to its draconian use against non-terrorists. Mm -hmm. It is also no answer to say that because other governments have had low conviction rates and maybe misused it against poor people, all such laws are misused against poor people. Therefore, the current misuse can be ignored or condoned. The facts show, the statistics show, that the use of sedition law and anti-terror law has statistically exponentially jumped till 2014. We cannot ignore that fact. The statistics are there for you to see. Equally, the fact that you do have poor people languishing in jails under Tada and Pota cannot justify the use for those who protested against citizenship laws under no stretch of any legal interpretation of any section of this law. Can any of these people, not only this batch, a lot of others who protested mm. be accused of either terrorism or unlawful activity. That must be said straight. Now, having said that, let me add, it is true that in judgments of bail, you need not give very detailed reasons. And one of the reasons the Supreme Court has today found is that this is a very detailed judgment which tends to lay down the law, whereas bail could have been granted on narrower grounds. That's a perfectly acceptable understanding. But I would disagree with the greatest respect with the Supreme Court's caveat today that this shall be ignored as a precedent. I'm not now talking of the release of the activists. They stand released. But not to be treated as precedent. I think this was a context and a situation where the Delhi High Court needed to put the thresholds of activation of such a draconian law clear. That is why they wrote a longer than usual judgment on bail. They had to state that on the face of it, Sections 2O and 15 cannot, under any circumstances, now I'm repeating, under any circumstances be used against any protester of CAA unless you found that the man is putting a bomb or shooting somebody. Now, that being so, uh, I think while they transgress the normal limits of writing a bail judgment, mm -hmm. equally the Supreme Court should have welcomed it as a very clear trigger point not being activated of UAPA and should have allowed it to remain, but they have done so. They will ultimately lay down the law. But the law, my point is, Rajdeep is clear on the text of the law. You see, you the problem... I have a fundamental the, uh, problem with the law itself. The <laughs> law is completely <laughs> against basic jurisprudence. There is no presumption of innocence. We, I just play, uh, we just did a story of Nandev. Fact, People have spent fact, nine years in jail. They spent nine years in jail, in fact, and I then see, after nine years, you see, no, I, they're not terrorists. So I lose nine years of my life. In fact, I, in fact, Rajdeep, this law has three or four admittedly draconian provisions. You cannot grant bail even after finding that I or Arima Sundaram satisfy the triple test. Namely, we will not abscond, we can be controlled, we will not yes. interfere. You have to give finding. You, you interception material is admissible, notwithstanding the Evidence Act, the IT Act, etc. The 180-day period is a special period for charge sheets. That is six months without. And also all other kinds of presumptions. For example, possession is a presumption. 
that you intended to use it. So this is a very draconian law. Therefore, the more draconian with these four elements, the more important to reduce its rigor and apply it to the core, narrow, genuine cases. Okay. So I would say that ultimately, you you know, th there is a catch here, Rajdi. By the time you wait for judgments like the Supreme Court or the High Court judgment to come, you already have had trauma and distress. Ex so the text of the law is clear. Why did the police apply it? Why did the state Sir, apply because, it? Why did because the as Dushyan Dave, senior advocate, told me the other day on, on this very show that we are at times a police state. We are a state where there is political abuse. Where whoever is in where power, to... whether it is a Congress government in the 1990s or a BJP government today, you abuse these laws to fit your political... Right, so and is, that's the is... difference I wanted to tell Aryama Sundaram between why I don't jump around with a murder. A murder law, there may be mistakes made by courts, but here it seems that there is over the last 30 years, Aryama Sundaram, a failure on the part of the Indian state to put an anti-terror law which is not subject to routine misuse. Yeah, the misuse is routine, Arya Masundaram. That's the difference. Hey, Rajdi, Rajdi, look, don't blame the law. Blame its application. Now, one point on which Manu and I both seem to agree is this, that it is a draconian law, it is necessary for terrorism, but the problem is its implementation. Why? Because such a draconian law should be very strictly applied within straight jackets. Mm -hmm. Now, that is what is not being done. And I, I will say this has not been done for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. We had previous governments who tried to ban a power also by misuse of such laws. We will always blame every government in power for doing so. What is the answer? The answer can only be a robust judicial system. A robust judicial system which will immediately... When anybody is arrested under, under this act, under the UAPA, it must come before a court straight away. And I am saying that they do, should not be waiting for the High Court and the Supreme Court to be granting them bail. But it is, the, it is at the child's court stage where the prima facie case should be strictly construed with what is terrorism. Do you the really believe that a trial... Do you believe really, sir, Mr. Sundaram, yes. aren't we being naive? Do you really believe a trial court judge or a lower court judge can resist the pressures from police and politicians in such cases? I believe he should. I, I am a utopian in that, and I believe he should. And the moment you say, can you believe he can do it, Rajdeep, you are saying you have no faith in the judiciary. Because the judiciary is not the Supreme Court and the High Court alone. The judiciary is right through. And if you are asking the question, can we have faith that he will do it, that means you have no faith in the judiciary. I have, Unfortunately, I... I I do have a very robust faith in the judiciary. Okay. And no, I you... think something has to be done about it. Okay, so you have faith. Final word, Dr. Singhvi, is part of the problem I... the fact that while we need a strong law to deal with terror, we've agreed that we need to define it narrowly. I just want to know how is it that tomorrow we can avoid more cases like Natasha, Devangna and Asif. That's my point. I have, I, yes. It's not that I don't have faith in the judiciary. The track record of our political class, police and the uh, judiciary is under scrutiny. Let me, let me say why I don't agree with my friend. There is a fallacy there, which let me explain. Uh, there is, a, unfortunately, first of all, the robust judicial system phrase is naivet. A robust judicial system always functions ex post facto. It is curative. It is not preventive. So you cannot transfer blame and responsibility to the judiciary without first blaming the invokers who initiate this action. Mm -hmm. That is the problem first. So the answer is sensitization, restraint, and proper governance, which is not happening. Two, if you continue with the invocation in the rampant, rampage way it is happening, then I will go to the extent of saying you will have to dilute or abolish this law, notwithstanding the license given somewhat to terrorism. Because you cannot have governments repeatedly violating it. I would still want it to remain, mm -hmm. but I would want governments to not invoke it. Oh. Third, the judiciary, of course, has to act, but it always, by its very nature, acts ex post facto. You don't factor in the delay. For the lowest court to act, it takes six months, two years. It took one year in this case, after the appellate process. So it's okay to say that the judiciary must act, but in actual fact, the minimal time taken is sufficient to cause the trauma and the object of most executives, irrespective of political color, who, who, who misuse a law like this, is to allow you to suffer in distress for that period. 
Sir, and then say now the law will okay. release you ultimately. Okay. So that's but, the whole point of the misuse. Be it okay. sedition or be it quota or be it tada or be it this law. The truth is, sir, this is all designed to have a chilling effect. We had to eventually abolish and then review tada. It happened also with quota. Will it happen with UAPA under a Modi regime? We don't know. But clearly, we need judicial scrutiny, which is why I hope that the Supreme Court at least will lay down the law in much more narrower terms when it hears this case again. Thank you both very and much. And give guidelines as to what is terrorism. Uh, well, good to have two legal eagles as always. Sharp viewpoints. Thanks very much for joining us here at the top of the news today.